idea right now is uh, to talk about the same experiences also um, of applications of lean and green or uh, industry uh, 4.0 solutions in the food industry. Eh? It's uh, something that also can be applied and is the, the objective of, of this seminar to see this type of applications. Uh, now? Thank you. Kevin? Yes. Yes. Right, so thank you. Uh, you all came back. That's, uh, that was for Ramon, not for me, but <laughs> right. So um, now we talked about the problem in the food supply chain that you've got lots of waste. And we showed one example of how you might go about fixing the problem. Um, I think I, for me, 80% of the problem 80% uh, of the solution is, uh, is understanding the problem and admitting the problem. Um, without that, I don't think we really have a good chance of uh, fixing. Um, over break, we were discussing with Matthias, and Joaquin, you asked the same question. Why is it that some are successful and some are extremely unsuccessful? It's the same companies, same tools and techniques, same advisors. I think the difference is in admitting the problem, the change management. Now, there are different stages of maturity in the relationship between lean and green or lean and sustainability. There are companies that see these as uh, contradicting issues. So uh, if I become more productive, become leaner, I become less green, less environmentally friendly. If you think about 200 years since Industrial Revolution, this has been the case. The more we produced, the more we polluted the earth. So many companies many companies are in the conflicting stages of maturity in terms of the relationship between the two. Uh, some companies go into the benign relationship between the two. They can go ambidextrous, one and the other in parallel, hand in hand. No conflict, but also no synergy. Some companies, few companies go into the thinking mentality that if I become leaner, I also become more sustainable or greener. Um, and eventually, I go into symbiosis. They are one and the same thing. This is the stages of your thinking, the company's thinking. It's got nothing to do with what is the state of polluting. It's just how I think about it. Can I be more profitable if I consider the health of the society? Or is there a conflict? Some think there is a conflict. Some think if I want to uh, line my own pocket, I have to make the society less healthy. This is many, many, many companies are still in that way of thinking. But some actually aren't. Some are thinking if I want to line my own pocket, it's better to think that I can do that through creating a healthier society. It's, uh, you know, and you are right either way. You know, you, either way you're right. It depends on how you think about the problem. That's your own mentality. So um, this one I call the innocence, not knowing what you don't know. This one is knowing what you don't know. This is not knowing what you don't, do know. And this is knowing what you know. You know the four stages of learning, if you like. And um, these are the known unknowns. It's interesting because, you know, in... Uh, we talk about Japanese stuff a lot in Lean because it started in Japan in 1950s after the war. Uh, but um, um, actually, I was talking to some Toyota executive about uh, Lean. You know, in Japanese, there is no word for Lean. For Lean is a Western translation. 
in Japanese, Toyota refers to it as Toyota production system or Toyota way, Nissan production system, Mazda production system, so on and so forth. It's, there is no word for it. Except there is actually a word for lean in Japanese. Uh, we, did, we have not documented this. Um, it's called monozukuri. It's a Japanese word. It means uh, craftsmanship, monozukuri. And what it actually means is m manufacturing in harmony or production in harmony. So I asked the Toyota executive, harmony in what? In harmony, he said. What do you mean? Well, I mean in harmony. Everything in harmony. It's the symbiosis thinking. So from the beginning, in the Japanese mentality, in the Japanese culture, there was no conflict be between being leaner and being more sustainable, being better for the society, be being better for the environment. It, there never was a conflict in the first place. This was the Western translation that created that conflict. The conflict is in our head. And it's the legacy of 200 years of polluting Earth uh, since the Industrial Revolution. We just are used to that. There needs not to be that. Right, so remember we said uh, if you take lean, it's about focusing on the consumer and eliminating waste. If you take green, it's the same thing. Uh, it's taking the consumers and eliminating different types of waste. Okay, so that on the surface is fine, right? There should be no problem. Now I am going to um, show you a video, okay? And it's a very simple task. It's a simple test that I'm going to give you. You're going to focus on the number of successful passes made by the white team only. Is the task clear? There are two teams playing basketball, passing the ball. One team is wearing white, one team is wearing black. You're going to count the number of passes that the white team is making. Is everybody OK? Show your hand if you're OK with that. OK? Everybody's OK. Let's show the video. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Okay, so what's the right answer? I would say 16. 16? 16? Anybody going for 15? 15? 15? Anybody going for 14? Nobody? Anybody going for 17? No, we, we have got a group split. Ramon, any opinions? No? Uh, we've got a split between 15, 16. It's actually not bad. Sometimes we have 13, 18 in the group. It's not too bad, actually, this time. So um, did you notice a hairy creature? No? Who's, who says yes? Yes? No? No? You did not? Who, who noticed the hairy creature? One, two, three people. Hmm. What about the rest? You're asking me what hairy creature? No? You want to watch it again? Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. This time don't count. Just watch. Wow. How can we possibly miss that? Hmm? What's happening? The question is, what's happening? Pardon? Focus. Focus. OK, so 
Focus is good or bad then? <laughs> what happens here? Any idea? OK, so you are focusing on the task. And you're missing the big picture. Yes? Is that? Well, uh, remember I showed you the value stream map with a lot of details on it? You know how much focus it takes to create those pictures? What's the whole point of doing a value stream map? The whole point is to see the big picture. It's, the whole point of doing a value stream map is not to miss the gorilla. Forget about the focus. You know? So it's contradictory in terms. And so in fact, our human brain has got two sides. Again, the holistic side and the linguistic side, the logos side. And then you go into one, you miss the other. You go into that one, you miss this one. And that's how a brain is, is designed, I'm afraid. This human being, that's us. I saw the gorilla the first time. I'm one of those who never counts. Someone else in the room will count. <laughs> but if you really want to focus, the chances are you might focus. You, must miss, uh, you could be missing the gorilla. What else did you see in the big picture apart from anyone else who saw any other changes in the big picture? Did you notice anything else? No? Actually, one of the players leaves the game. If I show you the again, the video, one person altogether leaves the game. Did you notice the color of the curtain behind us? That changes. It is at the beginning, it's red. Then it's gold, right? If I show it again. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. See? It's red. So to be honest with you, who, who cares if it's 15 or 16? <laughs> and the right answer is 17. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no. The, who cares? The point is. The gorilla. Uh, how do we make sure we don't miss the gorilla? And that's, that's the whole point of lean and uh, systems thinking, systems dynamics. The clue is in the world. Systems dynamics, the whole point is the system, is the big picture. Right, so, I mean, that's a real challenge for lean and sustainability. You want to go drill down into one small detail and you want to avoid missing the big picture at the very same time. This is a very tricky business when it comes to actually delivering this. Um, I am going to um, talk about the concept of the two together. Traditionally, lean was about going to the shop floor, improving capacity through some detailed tools and techniques, and increasing that capacity gives you some benefit. So I am here. I have a production line, you guys in a line, and I've done a time and motion study. And I say, I'm sorry. Sandra, is it? I'm sorry. You cannot come to work tomorrow with four limbs. I have done time and motion study. Half a person is not necessary anymore. So you come to work in only the left side tomorrow morning. This is how, in real terms, Lean is delivering the benefits. It's not really giving you, how do I do that? How do I pay Sandra tomorrow? Do I pay Sandra 50% as of tomorrow? Or do I actually really pay full time? Or if I just pay 50% as of tomorrow, what are the chances of my next improvement having people engagement? Nobody will help me. People are not stupid. They know what I'm doing. The reality is that the savings there are illusory, not real. This, the real saving would be if instead of saying to Sandra, don't come to work tomorrow, would be if I could say to Sandra, keep working very fast. And with extra efficiency that we have found on this production line, we make more products that we sell to the consumers. That is filling the capacity, which is the real deal, if you like. And it's always been the case since Henry Ford. And that is 2x. If that's x, that's 2x. But the reality is that that's not even enough. That is even boosted more if I find the 4x. And that comes from actually not wasting resources. Now I am working efficiently, effectively, and sustainably at the same time. If the product that I am making 
If it's a piece of apple, I am not wasting it. If it's meat, I'm not giving it away by weight, and so on and so forth. This is the full picture. And companies that have managed to create the full picture have gone into the stage of symbiosis. Now, this is, uh, at least in theory, this is very important. Let's see how many companies have really in practice. I'm going to show you some case studies of companies have done this in practice. However, before I show you the case studies, I want to take you back to the early days of operations management. Um, to the very early days, in fact, 1979. There was a man called uh, Phil Crosby. Uh, the reason this is not working is that it's not in presentation mode. Now it works. There was a man called Phil Crosby who wrote a book, Quality is Free. <coughs> Have you come across that? This was the mother of quality, TQM, basically. Um, so Phil Crosby said, making perfect quality doesn't cost you a penny more. Back in 1970s, this was a heresy. If you said you can have perfect quality at no extra cost, it was madness. Because you had a quality department that was sitting at the end of the line and checking the quality of every single piece. And so that's the cost of salary, cost of checking, and cost of reworking. How can somebody say quality is for free? Unbelievably crazy. But why do you think quality was free? How come it was free? Well, we know because the quality doesn't have to be checking the quality. You can integrate perfect quality into the process that you don't need to check it anymore. This is the concept of TQM. In today in manufacturing, you wouldn't have manufacturing of that camera over there or this laptop over here or any manufacturing industry for that matter without TQM concepts. This is taken for granted. Um, so Phil Crosby famously said, the first struggle, and it's never over, is to overcome the conventional wisdom regarding quality, that quality is a cost. And the problem of quality management is not what people don't know about it. The problem is what they think they do know about it. And this is the paradigm shift, if you like. So by the same token that you argue quality is free, but it's not a gift. You, you could argue that the environment is the same thing. It's, not, it's free. Having environmentally friendly products is free. Green is for free. It doesn't cost a penny more to be green. But it's not a gift. You have to create it. This is, this is not even important if really climate change is happening or not, when you think like this. The point is, this is a gain for you because you become more efficient. You become more effective. You're not doing it for some altruistic reasons. Who cares? It's you doing it for your own pocket. What's better than that? It's not doing it for the sake of the society. It's doing it for the sake of your own company purse. And this is what I've been saying to corporations, that actually activism, environmental activism, is not helping at all. It's alienating corporations. Corporations should do this stuff for their own sake for good capitalist reasons. And you remember the bestseller, uh, natural, natural Capitalism, that sold millions of books, uh, Hunter Lovins. She argued exactly the same, that this is about clever capitalism. Right, so enough about the theory. In practice, Quankin asked me to say whether you can be simultaneously profitable and sustainable at the same time. Again, let's go back to the early days of Lean. I worked for Dan Jones, who was uh, the man who wrote this book, The Machine That Changed the World. In 1990, that was the best-selling book. It changed, it literally changed the world. Everybody wanted to know what's happening. And what was happening was called lean. They called it lean. They, they coined the term lean. And it, was, it started in automotive, then went into other manufacturing, food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This, is, this is one picture from that book that tells the story. What they were doing, they were looking at Toyota versus uh, GM. Toyota, in terms of productivity, was 16 hours per car. GM was 31. So Toyota was twice as productive. In terms of assembly quality, Toyota was three times better. 
And in terms of inventories, Toyota was around 20 times better. Two weeks versus two hours. So what is happening is a clear uh, realization of quality is free. Toyota has put this into practice. They have better quality, three times better quality, with half the cost, twice productive. So now if you, if you don't read Phil Crosby's book, it's no more just theory. This is now reality. GM, Ford, Chrysler, nearly bankrupt. It, if it wasn't for go US government intervention, European and American car makers were all bankrupt. So for example, UK motorcycle industry did become completely bankrupt. Yeah, what do we do? We accepted the reality that there is something about lean. We have to do it. There is no way out of it. Address the problem. Let's go after it. The same thing that food industry has started to go to do more recently. Now, we looked at the same, uh, so we said if you can prove that quality is free, better productivity and quality, better cost and quality are possible at the same time, can we prove the same thing for, uh, uh, for green, for environmental performance? How do you do that? You have to do, to, you, we repeated the same benchmark of 1988, 1989, this time in 2012, 2013, and uh, we looked at, um, the car industry to see if the cheapest and best quality is also the best environmental performance. Can we prove the same case, that green is for free? Well, there are different ways to look at uh, environmental impact. You can look at it just by production, which is this side, and you look at it from post-production, which is the life cycle. And we looked at it, in fact, in both ways. I'm going to show you the brief benchmark, which is just the production side. And you can see that as it happens, the best quality car maker and the cheapest cost car maker still is Toyota as of today because that benchmark has been repeated every year. And uh, you can see they are also the lowest tons of CO2 per vehicle manufactured. So they have the lowest emissions on average compared to the GM and Ford and Volkswagen and Honda and the rest as of today. Not only they're the cheapest, best quality, but they're also the best environmental performance. So what it proves is that being the best environmental performance doesn't cost you a penny. In fact, it is better from a cost point of view to go after it. Because you reduce, it's obvious, because you improve your efficiencies. What else did we expect? So this was the, this was the way to prove the case. Now, again, we know what to do. The question is how to do it. How to do it goes back to the same uh, lean business system model that we need to do the supply chain, the internal processes, the strategy deployment, leadership and engagement. Um, it, it is actually um, quite possible to combine all four in uh, one go. I have given one example of how to deal with supply chains. I'm going to give some quick examples of this side, which is the process management side of it. I'll be brief in my examples and leave the rest to the questions. So how do we internally improve our uh, leanness and sustainability simultaneously? Well, I said it's about bringing the two sides of the brain together. Well, here is one example. Case study number one. This was a food industry company. This was a sandwich manufacturer. Um, if you go to the book website, you can download the full details. What we have done, we have looked at all the inputs and outputs. So you have all the things that go in, w materials, water, energy, and all the things that come out, finished products, waste, effluent, so on and so forth, carbon footprint. You can look at here, when we, when we created this picture, the site director, the general manager of this sandwich factory, said, stop, I have a problem. Look at my bread waste. This is a sandwich factory, right? Look, I have 1,600 tons of, of bread wasted. This is a huge amount of waste. What can you do for me? OK, so let's apply a very well-known lean technique, a Kaizen Blitz type technique. Bring together some of your managers, go to the floor, and see what we can do. So we did that. We created 
what we call a green impact matrix, which is a simple matrix. You put all of your processes from the intake to the um, outbound logistics across the top, and you put your different types of waste here. So this was the uh, solid waste, and this was the liquid waste. And you do a color coding. You can say, is it a red? Is it a wasteful process? Or is it amber, orange? Or is it a green, zero waste process? And so on and so forth. Very quick approximation. It probably takes an hour, an hour and a half, maximum two hours, with about 10 managers to create this picture. Um, OK, so you get an idea of where your waste is, the reds and the, and the oranges. You can then go and focus on them. Then, uh, in this uh, simple example here, the group took, because there were 10 managers involved, they each took one uh, as an assignment. And they applied another lean technique called an A3. An A3 is a very simple problem solving technique that comes from Japan again. The story goes that the Japanese uh, only accepted one page report for problem solving. And the larger, largest piece of paper they could find was an A3. Uh, you know the. How do you call it in Spain? Is it A3? So it, was a, it is an A3 piece of paper. On one side, you have the problem. On the other side, you have the solution. Check and act. So plan, do, check, act. This is the only routine for problem solving in Lean is plan, do, check, act, the simplest that. One side is the plan. The other side is do, check, and act. So you can see in this uh, humble uh, example is 16 hundred tons of bread being wasted in this company. This is actually, by the way, this was the largest sandwich factory on the planet at the time we were doing this. It was making millions of sandwiches a week, three or four million sandwiches a week. It was making, it was supplying all the major retailers. And uh, how it works is that they found, when they did a pie chart of the bread waste, they found that actually the biggest part of it are the crust. So how it works, in the sandwich factory is that you've got a production line which is much longer than this table. It's about maybe 25 or 30 meters long. And the bread, there is a person standing at the feeder of the line and takes a loaf of bread, which is exactly like the same loaf of bread that you buy from your supermarket. It's about a foot long. Okay, And uh, the first thing they do, they take the two crossed out and they put it into a bin which was color coded yellow, and it goes into animal feed, so it's recycled completely. And then the rest of it goes into manufacturing the sandwiches. Right, so the question is, why do we have so much uh, cross waste, the, the two crossed, the two sides? It's obvious because, because somebody's taking the two crossed out. So if you are the problem solver, what would you do here right away? How would you solve the problem? Any ideas? Hmm? Go on. But the, the question is uh, consumers don't like the crust. You know the loaf, the two sides, because it's like a crust, the, the consumers don't like it. But may, maybe you're right. Maybe some consumers like the crust. So maybe you can have a separate line making crust sandwiches. Has no crust. No, but that, that's a question to be asked. At least it's legitimate to ask these questions, right? In fact, they came up with 10 different suggestions. You can't read it because it's confidential for a reason. But it's 10 different suggestions. There. Two of the suggestions you just said. Can we bake a bread without the crust? Ask the bakery. Can we make a sandwich with crust only? Separate line. The other question is, why should it be a foot long? Right? If you make it a meter long, you suddenly reduce your cross space by a third. If you make it two foot, it's half the, half the base, and so on. And that's a lot of money, right? OK. And all of these were the 10 suggestions. So we went to visit the supplier. And the supplier said, yeah, very. when we are walking the cutting machines, the supplier says, um, oh, we've told you that we can reduce the thickness, the thickness of the two crossed. What do you mean? We mean that we can 
take a loaf and reduce the thickness of the crust so you will have one more slice out of each one of your crusts. Really? Yes. Who have you been talking to? To such and so person in your company who is sitting in an office in a different, different side of the company who never talked maybe to the other parts of the company. So simple solution without much effort having two very thick crusts going to a thin one and a thick one. 50% of the waste goes away. 50% of this goes away. This was, this was nearly a million euros. Nearly a million euros saving in real terms. Just one action like that. Again, uh, do you think these people were simple people? Absolutely not. Very good managers. Extremely good managers. But is it easy to realize this? No. You can only realize it when you bring different people from different departments in a focused effort to deliver this with the right leadership, with the right problem-solving mentality. Long story short, this company, this company managed to save significant amounts of money out of the 10 A3 projects they had. I just gave you one of the 10. And this is uh, applying the mentality of reducing economic waste to reducing the environmental waste. As I said, the two are pretty much the same thing. Um, here is another example. This was a seafood company. They had, when I worked with the board of directors of this company, the managing director said, I have a problem. My utility cost is too high. Can you please look at the utility cost? Said, OK, let's create the picture. Um, so they were, they, they were not even driven by the environmental concerns. They were driven by the cost. We created the similar uh, matrix. This time we added energy and water to the solid waste and liquid waste. So we added other types of waste. We did other A3s, five A3s in total. This was the saving from the total of $500,000 that we targeted between five different A3s they saved $180,000 in real terms in about a few days focused improvement. So another example is this one. This was in Shanghai, near Shanghai, somewhere in China. Again, this was a multinational food manufacturer, a very large food manufacturer. We looked at, again, this is the inputs and outputs. We looked at everything going in and everything coming out. We applied lots of different A3 problem solving techniques. They brought 20 of their best engineers. They focused. We started on a Monday morning, finished on a Friday afternoon, five days. They looked at these 10 different areas. They saved by the end of the week, they had saved 16% of their total site energy consumption and 15% of the total site water consumption. In China, water is expensive. Um, it's very, very much focused on those improvements. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the improvements. They don't matter. What matters is the mentality of the, of the problem solving. So you can see in these cases, again, my rule of thumb, you can, by applying the focused problem solving uh, improvement techniques of lean to the world of environmental and green, you are going between 10 to 30% of utility cost reduction. Um, so. Again, doing this for the sake of your own company rather than for the sake of environment is absolutely fine. Both of them give you exactly the same results. Um, some of these companies were concerned by the environment, like in fact this Shanghai factory. Some of them were not. They were just concerned with their own uh, economic gains, which is perfectly OK for a business to be concerned with their economic gains. Very OK. And uh, both delivered the same thing. Now, as a final slide, I want to show you this. Because I think it's about change of mindset, going away from thinking conflict to thinking symbiosis. One, one is the other, and the other is the one. Um, 
Okay, so that's it. And do we have time for questions? Okay. Right, so. Any questions? No, just, um, just a comment on this case of the crust. Did you put, uh, like, I've, I've been working briefly in, in lean manufacturing, but I, I, I have also found that uh, rather than having the managers sometimes, like, going down to the factory to to get out of their, like, crystal castle or something and go to the real place where things happen, uh, I found sometimes more useful to currently empower the proper employees who are currently the, the owners of the process, the guys who really know how that, how that works because they do it thousands of times per day. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, rather than the, this focus on the management, uh, we should put more focus on the proper employee uh, and trusting his experience and uh, they usually have the best ideas to, to fix the small things uh, in their proper role, no? That's at least my experience. I, I totally, I totally agree because um, uh, there is this, uh, again, one more Japanese word for you is Gemba. Gemba in Japanese means the crime scene where the work is working. It's the probably the single most important concept, which is the manager doesn't, doesn't know what really is happening, should not know, should not pretend to know. Who knows best? Operator. Without a doubt. And that's actually, again, a paradigm shift. It's a mindset shift. So you can take all of these tools and techniques and apply it in the wrong mentality will give you zero result. The example of the cutting machine with the 3D scanning is one example. Or you can take all of these concepts and apply it with the right mentality, which is let the Gemba bring up the suggestions rather than the top taking them down. Does it mean that in uh, Japanese companies, any, everybody can do whatever they like? Absolutely not. It's really disciplined. There are two different things. It's not about lack of discipline. It's about empowerment of the, of the organization. Yeah. So I totally agree with that. Any question? I, I have one. <laughs> yes, you know, you know me. <laughs> yes, for me, a very impressive the, the Shanghai, uh, Shanghai example where you reduce 16% uh, energy consumption, I think, no? Uh, and then, uh, because uh, we have al uh, f already finished uh, some project about improving energy efficiency in, in agri-food cooperatives, and the idea is you are, you are going to the company, you are going to make some energy audit, and then many times the recommendations is about uh, some investments you are going to do uh, for improving energy efficiency. But my feeling is that this uh, figure you have there is only about uh, when you are working with processes, you are going to get this. Uh, and I think it's something very important um, I don't know what do you think really this is the potential for for improving energy efficiency when you are working with uh, just with processes it's a very extremely important uh, perceptive uh, comment you make thank you for that comment you know McKinsey did a study in uh, I think 2012 of the US economy the biggest source of energy in the United States of America today is energy efficiency Biggest source of energy is energy efficiency, is the energy that we're wasting. That's for US study only, but of course you can imagine the same thing is everywhere more or less. So for companies, the biggest source of energy they have is the energy that they're wasting. So uh, rule of thumb, I have done this numerous times. We have never been outside the 10 to 30%. We've never been more than 30. We've never been less than 10. The bracket of 10 to 30. If it's a really efficient company, we are around 10, 15. If it's less efficient, we are. And this was a multinational, 
design company that they replicate the same design of these factories everywhere in the world. This is an extremely efficient design, actually, and it is around 15 and 16. Uh, and, and the solutions were incredibly simple, which now they have, this company turned this into a KPI for all of the global production. Everywhere in the world, they have to repeat this exercise. This is 2000 and March 2010. Since then, they have to repeat the same exercise at least once a year, everywhere in the world. Unfortunately, they don't invite me to do it. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they got a good deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it shows how how serious this is. A very interesting business. They take it very seriously. Very, very, very large business too. Extremely big industry. And they they learned the what you said that the biggest source of energy is energy efficiency. Okay. Thank you.